or a couple more examples of some stoichiometry here. Uh, then we're going to talk about the experiment that's happening uh, on Thursday. And uh, then I think that will be all done talking, I hope. Yeah. All right. So uh, first off, any questions on what we've been talking about here? Linear agents, basic stoichiometry problems. All right. So uh, the next thing we're going to kind of talk about is in sort of relationship to stoichiometry problems is uh, reaction yields. And there really is two types of, or three types of yields that we come across. Uh, we sort of touched upon it as we were doing some of the examples. Uh, that is your theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that, again, you should make uh, if you started with a certain amount of reactants. And if everything went perfectly, no side reactions, again, you were in a klutz and spilled everything all over the place. Um, that is technically how much product you should produce. So again, a yield is a product. It has to be a product when we talk about yields. Um, that's technically how much you should get out. In reality, things don't work that way. Reactions aren't perfect. Sometimes side things happening. Uh, we have the other type of yield, which is the actual yield. And the actual yield is pretty much what it sounds like. It is the actual amount of product that you actually produced when you did the reaction. I would say in textbook problems, they typically will give you that number somewhere in the problem. They'll say, hey, you produced this amount of product or something like that. So in the laboratory, obviously, you would be uh, doing the experiment and getting that number yourself. If you take both of those together, we get what's known as the percent yield. And the percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield, and you times it by 100%. For percent yield, we are looking for sort of a larger number. Yeah, so close to 100 or less. Uh, we don't want a small yield. A small yield means you did a pretty crappy job, pretty much is what that means. Uh, do we want over 100%? That also means you probably did a crappy job somewhere along the way there because you really shouldn't get over 100%. So, you know, 90s, high 90s, really good percent yield. Uh, but usually, again, if you go over 100%, you probably mess up somewhere. And again, we don't really want a low number. Sometimes people get percent yield and percent error confused. Percent error, we do want low number. Percent yield, we want a higher number than that. Now, how do we get the theoretical yield? Again, that's going to be a calculation based off of the problem. It will either be a basic stoichiometry problem or it'll be a limiting reagent problem. But you'll have to do some type of stoichiometry sort of calculation to do that. So why don't we try one here, perhaps, and see. Uh, so if we have this reaction, we'll do this one. Why not? Um, there we go. So if we take uh, 2.46 grams of TiCl4 with a molar mass of 189.7 grams per mole, and it reacts with 1.13 grams of magnesium, molar mass from the periodic table, 2431, we want to know uh, what is our theoretical yield of Ti in grams? And we also want to know what is the percent yield if we produce 0.542 grams of TI. So take a few moments there, see what you get. TI is from the periodic table 4788. So we're looking for our theoretical yield and also our percent yield in this case. Okay, so let's take a look, see how you're doing. Uh, I'm going to, again here, uh, show you the ice table approach so you can see it a couple more times in case that's the way that you want to do it. Um, again, no matter which way of the three we sort of talked about, you do the first two steps pretty much the same in all of them. Again, we need a balanced equation, uh, which we do have here. Uh, we do need to convert whatever they gave us to moles. And by the way, we do know that this is a limiting reagent problem because uh, we have the grams of this guy, which means we could very easily get some moles. And we have the grams of this guy, which means we also could get some moles. So again, that is how you know uh, that you can get the moles of each of those guys, that this is a limiting reagent problem that you got going on. So uh, we're going to convert those guys into uh, moles, and they were nice enough to give us the molar mass of each of those things. If they didn't, obviously, you would need to go to the periodic table. So 2.46 grams of TiCl4, using that molar mass there from the periodic that they gave you, 189.7.
going to give us for our starting moles here of our TICL4. Looks like uh, 0 0.01297 moles of our TICL4. We'll do a similar calculation for the magnesium, 1.13 grams. Also, they gave us the uh, molar mass there from the periodic table, 2431. Going to get us there, 1.13 divided by 2431, uh, 0 0.04648 moles of magnesium. So at this point, we can, again, uh, put that into our ice table for our initial line. Uh, again, here we have 0 0.01297 moles for our TICL4. And for our magnesium, 0 0.04648. It's going to be 0 for our products, as we pretty much do not have anything going on there. The change part here, remember, this is the part that takes into the stoichiometry part of it into account. Reactants are going to be minuses. So this would be minus X because the coefficient here is 1. This would be minus 2x for our magnesium because the coefficient is 2. On the product side, this would be plus x as this guy is 1. And this would be plus 2x as the magnesium chloride is 2. Just bringing everybody down. And again, I'm going to kind of eliminate the uh, moles there so it's not so crowded. Minus x. This is going to be 0 0.04648 minus 2x, this will be x and 2x. Any questions on the table or how to do that? Remember at this point, we're going to determine which one is our limiting reagent by just simply setting each of these guys equal to zero. So that equals to zero, that equals to zero. This one's pretty easy. X is gonna equal 0 0.01297 moles. Over here, this will give us basically 2x is equal to 0 0.04648 dividing by 2 uh, will get us 0 0.04648 divided by 2. Uh, Going to get us 0 0.02324 moles. Once again, here we're looking for the smallest. So in this case, that is our smallest. That means we don't really need this guy's calculation. And again, that X value would be every X that we see pretty much here in that sort of equilibrium line. Any questions on that? That again tells us in this case that it is the uh, TiCl4, that's our limiting reagent. The magnesium here would be our excess reagent in this case. So now we can really get to our theoretical yield of TI, and we can basically just look at our table, and we see that TI at the end equals X. So uh, because the moles of TI equals X, that means that our moles of TI should be 0 0.01297 moles of TI. I can now use the molar mass of TI from the periodic table, 47.88 grams per mole. And that will give me my theoretical yield here of TI in grams. If I punch the number right, it will. Uh, I think I did. That will give me 0 0.621 grams of TI, which would be our theoretical yield. Any question on that there? <clears throat> Now, again, the uh, benefit of this, although not really uh, necessarily needed in this problem or asked for in this problem, again, you could also find out everything else that you might want to know. And again, um, if we wanted to know, in addition, you know, our moles of magnesium chloride, that equals 2x here which would be 2 times 0 0.01297 moles, would tell us that for our other product, we would produce 
zero point zero two five nine four moles of magnesium chloride, which again we could also use the molar mass from the periodic table there to figure out how many grams that would be. And if you calculate the molar mass from the periodic table, it's 95.21 grams per mole. So we would also produce about 2.47 grams of our magnesium chloride in this case. So as you can see, not too much work to figure out, for example, how much of the other product, if it was a question, which obviously it wasn't in this case, we also, once again, could go back to our limiting reagent, which is this guy, and we could find out how much our, sorry, our excess reagent is left over by putting it into there as well, 0 0.04648 moles minus two times our X value. It's going to tell us that we have uh, 0 0.04648 minus two times 0 0.01297, 0 0.02054 moles of our magnesium left over. And if we times that by its molar mass of 2431 grams per mole, we would have roughly 0.499 grams of it left over. So once again, hopefully this demonstrates that super quick, right? You can pretty much figure out everything that you would need to know. Obviously with the magnesium there, we started with, uh, I forget how many grams there we started with, but uh, I erased it, I think. We started with 1.13 grams and we have that much left over. First off, any questions on that side calculation that you didn't really need to do in this calculation here? All right, so let's get back to the really the other thing that we wanted to calculate here was part of the question. Now that we took a side detour there to do all that other stuff that we really didn't need to do. Uh, we wanted to calculate the percent yield. So here, uh, our percent yield is going to be our actual divided by our theoretical times 100%. So our actual was given to us in the problem. So they did tell us that we did produce 0.542 grams. So that is the top part. Obviously our theoretical is gonna come from our calculation there. So our percent yield in this case uh, would be our actual 0 0.542 grams divided by 0 0.621 grams times 100%. And that will give us a percent yield of not too bad, I think. About 87.28%. Uh, That's decent. It's not like 50%, I suppose. So it's not too bad in that case. Question on any of those sort of steps there. No? By the way, when you do the percent yield calculation, uh, it doesn't always have to be grams or grams, although that's very common. It could be moles and moles. It could be whatever unit. As long as the top number and the bottom number are in the same units, you could still calculate the percent yield. So you could do moles over moles if you wanted to or something like that uh, to figure out the percent yield. Question on any part of that. Once again, you could always use the other two methods there uh, to figure it out. You should get pretty much the same numbers there. Any questions on that? All right, let's try another one here just to make sure. Let's not do this one because too big of numbers. All right, I think you have this one coming up next. All right, so let's do this one here. We're going to go 100 grams of ammonia and 100 grams of carbon dioxide reacting in this reaction. We produce 120 grams of our product. Uh, what is the percent yield? So a couple of numbers that might be helpful. Nitrogen, 1401. Uh, carbon, 12.01. Oxygen, 16. And hydrogen, 1.008. All right. Take a few moments there. See what you come up with here. 
Okay, so let's take a look and see how you're doing. So once again here, uh, we have 100 grams of this guy and we have 100 grams of our CO2. And we're looking for basically how many grams of our product here and our percent yield, which again is our actual divided by our theoretical times 100%. In this case, right there is our actual. So our theoretical is going to come from our calculation here. Once again, it's a limiting reagent problem. I know that because I got grams of this guy, which means I could definitely get the moles. And I got grams of that guy, which means I could definitely get the moles. So because I could get the moles of each of those guys, uh, this is going to be a limiting reagent problem here. So uh, again, no matter which way you go, we're going to basically do the same steps here to start with. We got a balanced equation. We do need to take what they gave us and convert it to moles. So we'll do our moles of uh, ammonia, which is NH3. We'll take our 100 grams of ammonia. We'll go to the periodic table, look up one nitrogen and three oxygen, or three hydrogens, might be better. Uh, and that's going to give us our molar mass, in this case, of uh, 1703. We're going to divide by that. And that will get us 100 divided by uh, 1703. Going to give us uh, 5.872 moles of NH3. We're gonna do the same thing with our other uh, reagent there, uh, our moles of CO2. We'll take our 100 grams of CO2. We'll go to periodic table, one carbon, two oxygens. That's gonna get you a 4401 grams per mole for our CO2. That is gonna get us 100 divided by uh, 4401. It's gonna give us a 2.272. Moles of CO2. Any questions so far? All right. So, once again, I'm going to roll with a little ice table here to solve it. Uh, so, initially, here for the NH3, we had 5.8, 5.872 moles. For our CO2, we had uh, 2.272 moles. Again, for our products, we can safely assume zero to start with. Change part, important again to take the coefficients. So minus 2x, this is a 1. So minus x, that's a 1. So plus x, and that's also a 1. So plus x as well in this particular case. That means when we come down here, uh, we basically got uh, 5.872 minus 2x, uh, 2.272 minus x, x and x. Any questions on the table here? We're going to find our limiting reagent now. Again, setting each of these guys equal to zero. That's going to give us an x of 2.272 moles. That's going to give us basically 2x is equal to 5.872. Dividing it by 2, they're going to get us 2.936 moles in this case. Here, we're looking for the smallest, and that's going to be the guy on the right, so we don't need this calculation. That would tell us in this particular case here that the CO2 should be our limiting reagent. And the excess reagent there should be the NH3. Any question on that determination? Here we are looking for the theoretical yield of our product, uh, which would be this guy right here. And we could see that the moles of this guy will equal X at the end, which means we have basically 2.272 moles of this guy. We do want grams, and the reason we do want grams is because our actual yields in grams, that way everybody's in the same unit. So we do need to do the uh, molar mass of this guy. That is uh, two nitrogens at 1401 plus four hydrogens at 1.008, as you do need to multiply in, right? And we do have a carbon at 12.01, and finally an oxygen at 16. That's going to give us 60.06 from the periodic table. 
So 60.06 grams per mole from the periodic table. Those are going to cancel. And that's going to get us there times uh, 2.272, about 136.5, I guess, grams of our NH22CO. This is our theoretical yield. Any question on that there? Now we have everything we need to calculate our percent yield. So percent yield going to be our actual, which was given to us. I think that was 120 divided by the theoretical we just calculated, which was 136.5 grams times 100% going to yield us here about 87.91, we'll call it our 87.9% yield. Still not too bad. Any questions on that? Obviously, again, if we want to know information about everybody else, we can go back into that table like we did previously and pretty much solve for it. Any questions on any of that there? All right, so again, limiting reagents, you know it's that type of problem. If you can get the moles of each reactant, you have three different ways you could do it. So choose whichever way you want to do those problems. Again, actual yield typically given to you. Theoretical, you usually have to calculate your basic stoichiometry or limiting reagent. Any questions on stoichiometry, how to do any of those problems there? All right. The last couple of things we're going to talk about here for tonight is to help also with the lab. Uh, so we're going to talk just a little bit about molarity. So you can do a calculation and be ready to go, hopefully. All right, so this is the one we just did, I think. There we go. I got the same number, so that's good. All right, so we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit here, and we're going to talk about solutions and concentration, specifically molarity. A solution is a homogeneous uh, mixture of two or more substances. Uh, homogeneous, right, means that it does look the same throughout. Um, Solutions are the ones that do get the aqueous symbol next to them. So when you see that aqueous symbol, that's a solution. That's a homogeneous mixture. Once again, there is a difference between a solution and a pure liquid. Water, for example, is a pure liquid. And we take water and some sodium chloride solid and put them together. The sodium chloride will dissolve and make a sodium chloride solution. Uh, once it dissolves in there, that would be aqueous. So aqueous usually implies that you dissolve something in something like water to make a mixture. There are two parts to the solution. There's the solute. That is the smaller part of the solution. And there's the solvent, which is the larger part of the solution. Water is a very common solvent, but not always good for everything, but works really well for ionic compounds and also polar compounds. Uh, works terrible for nonpolar compounds. So nonpolar things, water is a terrible solvent for it. The solvent is the larger part of the solution, like I mentioned. And again, uh, water there is usually very commonly done. In our example here, water would be our solvent and our sodium chloride would be our solute. How do you know the name of the solute in a solution? It is the same as the name of the solution, which means if you have a sodium chloride solution, sodium chloride is your solute. If you have a potassium chloride solution, potassium chloride is your solute. If you have a hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is your solute. So whatever the name of the solution is, is actually the solute. Again, if it's ionic or polar, probably going to be uh, water as your solvent, but again, uh, maybe not in all cases. Here's some other examples of solutions you may not think of. So the soft drink, soft drink, obviously you think of water is the major component. Then there's sugar and, and CO2. Air is a solution. The major component of air is actually nitrogen gas, uh, followed by oxygen gas, argon, and whatever else you're breathing in, depending on where you're standing, I suppose. And solder as well is mainly lead with some tin in it um, as well. So when we talk about solution, pretty much the main concentration unit that we use a lot for solutions is molarity. And molarity is big M, and it stands for moles of solute over liters of solution. And you should think of molarity 
as a formula because we do use it in many ways. So if you wanted liters, that would be moles divided by molarity. If you want moles, which is a very common calculation, you do want liters times molarity here. Now, if you had a 4.5 molar solution of sodium chloride, what that really means is you have 4.50 moles of sodium chloride in a liter of solution. When you are doing calculations involving molarity, I would highly recommend you get rid of the big M and you replace it for both of these units. The number always stays with the moles part. It's always one liter. The reason I highly recommend you do that is most people, when they leave the big M, all they think about are moles. They have no idea about the volume. Not even sure where the volume is. They just call it moles because it starts with an M and stuff like that. So uh, it's a very common sort of problem people have is they leave the big M and they just forget all about the volume. Not sure what they should do with it. This way, at least you can see both units. You could also use molarity as a conversion factor and do a more dimensional analysis approach. You could take it like we wrote it there, or you could flip it around and use it this way. Why would you maybe want to do a dimensional analysis approach in these calculations rather than just rearranging the formula? If all you remember is dimensional analysis, you just need to do opposites cancel. It will rearrange the formula for you without having to figure out how to do it properly if you're not sure. So as long as you go opposites, you know with dimensional analysis, everything on top gets multiplied, everything on the bottom gets divided, does all the math for you. So sometimes it's a lot helpful to take that type of approach when you're doing this. Now, <clears throat> whenever you are using molarity and volume together and you have a volume, you do need to convert it to liters. And that is so you can see here, liters times moles per liter cancels each other out and gives you moles, which is most likely what you're trying to calculate. Now, if you take milliliters times molarity, you do not get moles, by the way. You get what are known as millimoles, which are like moles, but a thousand fold difference. Yes, yeah? so you'll be off by a factor of a thousand which sometimes people do because then if you come back and divide by milliliters, the millis cancel and you're left with molarity again, moles per liter, so it actually works. But just to be safe, I would definitely, if you're using molarity and volume together, should always be in liters. That way you'll end up with the correct answer and not be off by that factor of a thousand. That's because again, like I said, uh, Molarity technically could be millimoles over milliliters. So that, again, is another sort of version of it. So why don't we try this one here? Let's calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 15.6 grams of KBR in enough water to make 1.25 liters. So uh, potassium is 39.10. And uh, bromine is a little 79.90 there, I think. All right, so see what you come up with there. We're looking for the molarity here. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so we're looking for molarity, which is moles per liter. We obviously have our volume ready to go. It is in the right units. I will say, obviously, uh, the thousand milliliters to liter conversion is used a lot as volume is oftentimes given to you in milliliters. You need to convert it to liters. So that conversion is used a lot. Similarly here, grams to moles is also used a lot. So again, that's going to be our molar mass for the periodic table. That's going to allow us to do that. Uh, we basically just need to add these two guys together and that's going to give us 119 grams per mole for our KBR. We'll take our 15.6 grams of KBR. We'll divide it by the molar mass from the periodic table. And that's going to give us the moles that we need, which in this case is 15.6 divided by 119. And we'll call it 0 0.131. That is the top part to what we need. 
So now to calculate the molarity, we'll take 0 0.131 moles divided by uh, 1.25 liters, 0 0.131 divided by 1.25. Here again, uh, the units do not cancel out. So you'll end up with 0 0.105. You could either leave it as moles per liter or you could write 0 0.105 big M if you like in this case. Any question? Up there. Okay, let's take a look at one more here, I think. All right, what mass of potassium iodide is required to make 500 milliliters of a 2.8 molar solution of Ki? Once again, K is 3910. That was 126.9, I think, iodide, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. All right, so we're looking for basically how many grams here of chaos. All right. Okay, so let's take a look uh, here. We do have uh, some information given to us. Uh, we have a volume, obviously, of 500 milliliters. Uh, we do have a molarity here of 2.8 molar Ki. Again, that means molarity is probably in play. Uh, and we do basically have the liters, although they're in milliliters right now, we do have the molarity. So if you weren't sure, uh, moles seems like a good idea there to solve for, since that's the only thing you're missing. Moles would be liters times molarity. So we should probably do a little bit of conversion here. So 500 milliliters, again, 1,000 milliliters in one liter will give you 0 0.5 liters. When you have 2.8 molar, again, I would get rid of the big M and use it as 2.8 moles per liter. Or you could flip it around and use it the other way if you needed to. I'm gonna actually take a more dimensional analysis approach, which means I'm gonna start with my volume and I wanna get rid of my volume, which means I need to go opposite. This would be that guy right there. And that would be 2.8 moles per liter. So if you weren't sure about this, if you just go dimensional analysis and opposite, now you know you should multiply basically both of those numbers and it will kind of do the math for you without having to rearrange the equation. 0. 0.5 times 2.8 gonna give us a 1.4 moles here of Ki. We obviously wanna know how many grams, so we'll add our molar mass together here and that will give us 39.10 plus 126.9. That's 166 grams per mole is the molar mass. And that will get us here uh, 166 times 1 1.4, about 232 grams of Ki in this particular case. So really what that number means is if you wanted to make the solution, you would measure out 232 grams of potassium iodide. You would take enough deionized water and put it together and mix it and get it to dissolve. Take it up to 500 milliliters, mix it up really good. You then should have a solution sitting there that has basically that concentration. Any questions on that calculation then?